Hello. Well, I'm delighted to be here, uh, particularly because it's such a fascinating intersection of subjects and such a fascinating combination of speakers that we're going to hear. There is that great quote from Gandhi that the greatness of a nation and its moral progress are judged by the way its animals are treated. Well, you could substitute the words greatness and progress for survival, and uh, the definition of animals clearly as far as this afternoon is concerned is that animals, it's not humans and animals, it's humans as part of animals. And in line with the ambitions of today, this session is going to seek to shift perspectives, to get a clearer view, maybe to map a way through. And that means sometimes abandoning traditional, often disastrous points of view, ones that have taken us to where we are, for unfamiliar and uncomfortable insights. So the panel that's been assembled, as I say, they're going to put forward to the, in the next hour and a half or so some startling ideas, observations, and experiences indeed. But there's an underpinning of reason and science to all of that. It's an impressive mix of academic, uh, academics, academe, and practice. So you'll be hearing from Professor Jenny C. Stevens, Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy at Northeastern University. I'm not going to give lengthy biogs because I know you can all click through on those links you've already got. From W.K. Luna, who hereafter will be referred to as Nell, who is the artist and PhD candidate. Robin Maynard, Director of Population Matters, and Dr. Emily Doolittle, composer and lead in art making in the Anthropocene at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. The way it's going to work is this. Uh, everybody will speak for roughly 10 minutes. If there is something that you would like clarified specifically about that presentation, there'll be a couple of minutes after they have spoken just to do that. But we want to keep the momentum going so that actually the real discussion happens after all four presentations and can involve everybody. So if you would kind of hold back your big thoughts, if possible. Um, but obviously, please do uh, feel free to question. I'll be up here to, to handle that, to question the speakers immediately after they do speak. So let us start. So I'm a composer and zoomusicologist. And a significant part of my practice is exploring the relationship between human music and animal songs. Today, I'm going to play three of my pieces, which explore different points of overlap between human music and animal song. The first of these points I want to look at is the use of patterns. Sound-making animals, including but not limited to humans, tend to balance the use of repetitions or patterns with variety or surprise. A certain amount of predictability is essential for the listener to know which piece, individual, or species they are listening to. But if something is too repetitive, the listener will get bored and stop listening. Here is the song of one of my favorite North American birds, the hermit thrush, which uses patterns on many levels. Here's the song in its entirety. So as you can hear, the song alternates between a short song and a slightly longer silence. But that's not the only level of patterning there is. The songs typically alternate between songs with a higher starting pitch and a lower starting pitch. So you can see this on this spectrogram here where the higher markings are higher frequencies. Um, and they also tend to go in an approximate uh, sequential order. It's not exact, but each hermit thrush will have a series of songs between six to, seven, six to 12 different song types, and they'll sing them approximately in order, though it's always varying. Um, but that's also not the only level in which patterns occur. Uh, each song itself has a very specific structure. So even though each of the bird's song types will be different, um, they follow a particular pattern. They all start with a long note that's called an introductory whistle, and then it's follow followed by two or occasionally three phrases of shorter pitches, slides, trills, noisy sounds, and so on. Um, the songs are quite fast, so they're hard for us to process. Birds process sound much faster than we do. So I'm going to play a recording of this song full speed um, and then slowed down so you can sort of hear 
uh, more and more of the detail. So that's all the same song. So when the birds are hearing that, they're hearing all that detail that we can only hear if we slow it down. Now, if you listen to a lot of their songs, you'll actually hear there's quite a similar style between the songs. And some of them also sound surprisingly like human music. There's some that sound like little bugle calls, for example. And the reason for that is that 70% of hermit thrush songs are based on the relationships between pitches that you find in the overtone series. I won't go into a long musical explanation here, but the overtone series is sort of a series of sounds that uh, you hear if you divide, divide a vibrating string or a column of air at different lengths. You hear a sound an octave up, an octave and a fifth up, uh, an oct you know, two octaves up, and so on. And lots of different kinds of human music incorporate the overtone series in, various, series in various ways, and so do hermit thrush songs. So I'll just play one more, mainly because I love hermit th songs so much, and I'm excited to share them with you. I had three, but uh, that was taking up too much time. So, oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, oops. Sorry, that's the beginning. So I've been studying hermit thrush song for about, well, since 2007 in a variety of different ways, through writing music based on hermit thrush song, in interdisciplinary collaboration with scientists, and also sort of looking at the cultural history of how people write about animal song and hermit thrush song in specific. People throw all kinds of cultural and hist historical baggage when they, you know, they think they're describing what they're hearing, but they're actually describing their own prejudices and assumptions about what a bird would sing, what music should sound like, and so on. Um, so I, I would say it's the animal song that I know best. And the next thing I'm going to play for you is a piece I wrote based on Hermit Thrush song. It's not a transcription, but it's the, since it's a song I've spent the most time with, I wanted to write something in the style of a Hermit Thrush. This piece is about three and a half minutes. Um, and Hermit thrush song doesn't tend to vary very much, but they do take a little bit of liberty with how many times they'll repeat something, with, uh, you know, sometimes phrases may be included or left off. So I've given the flutists that same degree of freedom in their performance of the piece. Can you turn this up a little bit? Sorry. Oops. That's Sorry. I don't know how to stop without going to the next slide. I'll just let you turn it up a little bit before I start the piece. <laughs>
to stop there because I'm going over time already. But if you want to hear the rest of the piece, I think it's on my website. Or you can write to me. The next thing I wanted to discuss is context. Animal songs, just like human music, always occur in a context. So for example, a human lullaby and a human sports song or national anthem will sound quite different, just like the song that birds sing to young on their nest and their ter territorial call will sound quite different. Um, gannets are large seabirds that nest in sea cliff colonies of tens of thousands of birds called gannetries. I actually, I think most of the gannetries in the world are in the UK. The massive guttural clacking sounds coming from a gannetry can be overwhelming to a human listener, but gannets themselves are able to recognize the calls of their young, their mates, and their neighbors. These calls must be distinguishable in amongst the sound of the ocean, the elements, and other bird species. So here's an example of the sounds in a gannetry. <laughs> I love that kind of song. I know it's not going to be kind of tea. <laughs> so the next piece I wanted to play for you is based on the sounds of a gannetry. It was written in collaboration with a poet, Dawn Wood, so when I play the piece, you'll hear her reading her poetry at the same time, and I wrote it for clarinetist uh, Joe Nicholson. It may not sound like it, but everything that you'll hear in this piece is just her playing clarinet, and then there's another musician, Ellie Cherry, who recorded and looped it, so it may sound like it's an electronic piece, but it's actually all clarinet sounds. And you'll notice the notation is quite different than the last piece I showed you. In the last piece I showed you, I did want to specify pitches and rhythms, so I used traditional uh, Western music notation. But in this piece, I had an idea sort of the, te of the textures I wanted and the kind of overlap of different calls, but I didn't want to specify how the clarinetist would play it. And in fact, you could play it on any instrument. Um, so I wanted to do something a little bit more visual and let them interpret it, you know, those visuals the way they wanted. Um, and one of the things that amazed me was this performance sounded exactly the way I had imagined it would or hoped it would, even though this is what the clarinetist had for her score. I'll play about five minutes of this piece, which it's longer than that, but again, you can hear it elsewhere if you'd like to. Garnet Rock. Fate whispers to the warrior, you cannot withstand this storm. And the warrior whispers back, I am the storm. Maybe at birth, I was a boat setting sail on the sea of the waves that happened to me. Or maybe I was the wave itself, connected with all the water there is. And I could aim for that rock over there and see what the weather brings my way. There used to be shamans who worked with the wind. They'd carefully gather it into knots and you could pay them for a string and you'd undo the knots at sea to brace yourself, to get your breath on the crest of a wave of the shocking nerve that you'll withstand. You are the wave. You tell yourself that there's no harm in the unexpectedness of rain, though the randomness of where and when a drop might fall has been described in an equation here and there. Since nothing ever comes from nowhere and there's no sound without a source, the circling seabirds contain the proof, the way that knot could store the wind, the puffins and the cormorants, the leeches' petrels, herring gulls, the foomers, all fulfill the energy invested and released in them. But gimlet eyes make up the rock 
where clacking prehistoric beaks of gannets guard their modicum of space before they plunge through you, the wave. I'll move on to the last point of overlap I'd like to discuss, which is communication. I don't mean communication in the sense of transmitting information. We usually use language for that. Animals use various vocal, chemical, physical means. But communication in the sense of um, sharing an emotional state, acknowledging self and others, and saying who we are and what group we're part of. This is common across species. For example, in group wolf howls, each uh, wolf sort of fits their howl into the group in a way that uh, sort of coincides with their part, I don't want to say status, but their role within the group. Um, but it also can enable communication with other species. And I'm going to end with a, a short recording of a <laughs> practice I developed with my um, dog, Idris Donut. We, during lockdown, we developed a practice of howling and playing oboe together. He was howling and I was playing oboe. Uh, and I've got a 90 second clip of, uh, so you'll notice this is yet another form of notation. This is more a process piece. Um, I, I've got another version where it says you can, you know, substitute another instrument in another species, in another kind of dog as well. But uh, this is sort of how we developed our practice. Um, so I'm just going to end with a short video clip of me and an oboist friend, Kristen Cook, playing with my whippet, Idris Donut. Um, and I just want to mention that there is a crate there, but the crate door was open. He's always free to come and go. And I noticed when I play the oboe, Sometimes he comes and howls with me, and sometimes he wants to do something else, and that's fine. It's a voluntary activity for both of us. <laughs> this is about uh, one minute and 30 seconds. Um, and he's got an amazing sense of exchange. Like, he really listens, comes in, sort of goes through our pitches, comes in after we do, stops after we stop. So I am, was really, I know it's sort of fun and silly, but I also found it surprisingly moving. I'm going to invite us all up for the group wolf howl in a moment, actually, so that we can all, jo all join in. But just before we do, any immediate question for Emily? There will be plenty. Oh, masses of immediate questions for Emily. 
Uh, um, my mum is, is this on? Um, I just wanted to say thank you because that was such an eye opener to me. And in fact, this entire panel, I have to say, each one of the four speakers, this has been a very, very emotional panel. And I'm sure everybody in the room has felt this. Everybody, uh, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been incredible to witness. And I had one question for you, Emily, mm -hmm. which was obviously incredible listening to birds and you give me a whole new dimension when I'm out in the country this weekend. Um, and definitely dogs. Uh, but, but have you ever been under the ocean? Have you ever been deep to hear the noises of the ocean? And I no. wondered if that was something no, of interest to you. No, I have not. Uh, I'm interested in other people making those recordings, but I'm claustrophobic enough that I don't personally <laughs> want to go under the ocean. <laughs> okay. I might send a record, you know, a micro or hydrophone down there. That I would be interested in doing. But I'll stay in the boat. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. What? Uh, I haven't personally worked with whales, but I've written some pieces based on uh, whale vocalizations. And I have a uh, doctoral student who will be graduating soon, Alex South, who's looking at um, sort of humpback whale song from a musical and biological perspective. So I'm co-supervising him with uh, two biologists at St. Andrews University. Hi. We, uh, we've been thinking a lot at my company recently about like the sensory experience of being outdoors and mm -hmm. trying to have your kit not interact negatively with you or the environment around you. Uh -huh. But I was kind of wondering the way you seem to have an understanding of the communication of birds. Could we positively interact or incorporate that into our experience? Like, yeah. Um, I'm going to speak as myself and not as a biologist, which I'm not. Um, personally, I think some animals are quite curious about us and quite interested in interacting with us. Um, I think it can be easy to misinterpret things. So for example, if we go outside and play some music, maybe a bird will start singing. And it's a little bit too easy for us to think, oh, the bird likes that. But unless, if we know a lot about that bird, we might realize that actually it's singing its alarm song or you know, telling us to go away. <laughs> But I also think that animals can be very curious about us. For example, gray seals will start howling when we sing. And I mean, I feel okay about singing on a beach and seeing if the seal will respond. Sometimes they even come closer. Again, I don't think it's very ethical to pursue them or put them in a place where they can't get away. But personally, I think it is possible to develop genuine friendships and interactions with animals that are based on mutual curiosity and enjoyment of each other's sounds. I mean, I think there is, or there can be ethical questions about writing music based on animal songs. And one of the things that, again, I don't have a definitive answer, but one of the things that makes me think that maybe if we're careful, it is okay, is that there's lots of animals that will also imitate sounds that humans make and use them in their songs. So I am sort of looking for some kind of mutuality, even though I recognize that I only know my own part of it. Great. Thank you very much.